Hello and welcome to Starfish Maths. My name's Sarah and today I want to look at functions. I'm going to cover domains and ranges, composite functions and inverses. I'll work through some examples of each and then look at an exam question. As ever, please do grab a pen and paper, pause the video and work through it yourself, rewinding and fast forwarding as you need. I hope this is helpful. Let's get started. We'll begin with a very simple function. And a function is just really a rule that takes a bunch of numbers to another bunch of numbers. So the numbers that you input take the place of x. Say you want to input 4 as a number, then you do f of 4, so you're replacing x with 4, so 2 times 4 plus 5. You can also do the opposite and figure out what you did start with if your output would have been 11. So setting up that simple equation and solving it to get the input would have been 3. I'm using the language input and output, but let's start speaking of domain and range. The domain is the set of x values, the input that you start with, and the range is the output, so kind of like the y values. And the best way to find the domain and range for any function is to think about the graph. The graph of 2x plus 5 is a straight line. y equals 2x plus 5 is a linear relationship. So there's nothing that the domain and the range couldn't be. But what we can do, if we want to, is restrict the domain and then see what happens to the range. So let's restrict the domain to all the numbers between minus 2 and 3. So we'll just put x between those and including them. Sometimes you see um, the domain and the range written in curly brackets. You don't have to use them, but that's sometimes used. As I said, the 2x plus 5 will be a straight line. So that will be crossing at 5 and it's a positive gradient, so it'll be going that way. Um, and let's figure out where it will be when x is minus two and three. So putting minus two into here, two times minus two plus five, that would be one. And putting three is our x, two times three plus five is 11. Okay, my scale isn't brilliant on here but you can imagine it anyway. So that's our straight line. The function is restricted so it begins and ends with minus 2 and 3 and then your range you can see is the values is fluctuating between on the y-axis so 1 and 11 and that will include those values as well and this time we can write, we don't write y, but we write f of x, the language that we used here. So I hope that's clear, that's domain and range. Let's look at a slightly more complex function now. Okay, here I've chosen a different function. I've chosen a fraction because that sometimes comes up. Um, and thinking about the domain and range for this function, um, unlike the other one, this one, there are going to be some values that it naturally can't be, the domain and the range. So to find those out, we're going to draw the graph. Now obviously you can use a graphical calculator if you've got one, but um, it's really good practice to be able to draw the graph of this. Um, and there's a trick you can use to make this look a little bit simpler so you can draw the graph. What we're going to do is split this into two fractions. So we're going to force the top to look like the bottom. Now of course we don't have x plus 3 on the top, we've got x plus 4. So we actually need to plus another 1, because x plus 3 plus 1 would give us x plus 4. But we've separated it out, we've split it into two separate fractions, so that we would get that. Those, those things are equal. But by writing it like that, that fraction will cancel down to just 1. And now can you see that looks much more like the graph of 1 over x. Hopefully you know that the graph of 1 over x is asymptotic. It has asymptotes, so it looks like that. Um, and this is a graph transformation of that one. Plusing 1 on the outside makes it move up 1. And plusing 3 with the x makes it move to the left by 3. So those asymptotes are going to move. So here I've put asymptotes as dotted lines at 1 and minus 3 
and the graph's still going to have that curved shape tending towards the asymptotes. Good. Now that we've drawn the graph and found those asymptotes, we know what is restricted on the domain and the range. The domain is all the x values apart from minus 3. So the domain is that x can't be minus 3. It's the only value it can't take. And the range is all the y values apart from 1. So g of x can never be 1. So unless we impose more restrictions, that's the most the domain and the range can be. That's the only things that they can't take. Brilliant. Let's play around with f and g to look at composite functions. So composite functions are when you, you use a function on another one. You've got a function of a function, one put into the other one. So you could do f of g or g of f. Sometimes you see it with another pa pair of brackets as well like that. You, you don't have to, I'm just going to leave them out, but some people use that. What we've got here is we're doing f of g. f is kind of encapsulating g. We're starting with f as the outer function and g is the inner function, if you like. And what I'll do is I'll use the colours so it's a little bit more obvious. So we've got the outer function is g, but instead of x, we're actually using g of x. We're using this entire expression as our value that we're inputting. So that's f of g and there's not really much I need to do to simplify that so I'll just leave it as it is but hopefully that's clear how to get it. And let's do g of f so we're starting as g as the outer function. So we've got some stuff plus 4 and then we're inputting the 2x plus 5 Good, and this one we can really easily collect those terms and simplify them. So remove the brackets and collect those up. Brill. Another thing you can do is, is apply a function to itself. So you can do g of g, for example. I'm not going to use the colour this time, but hopefully you can have a go at this one. And I've chosen to use g on itself to get stacked fractions to show you another little trick. Stacked fractions look horrible but there's nothing to worry about. All you need to do is multiply every term by the denominator. So we're going to multiply everything by x plus 3. So multiplying that by x plus 3 will just leave the top. And then we multiply the 4 by x plus 3. I have a horrible feeling I'm going to run out of room here. Um, I'll move up here. So expand the brackets and simplify. <laughs> yeah, totally run out of room, but yeah, that's g of g. And of course another thing you can do, which you could be asked for, is to do g of g of an actual value. So plug in a number to that expression there. Great, so we've looked at domains, ranges and composite functions. Now let's look at the inverses of f and g. An inverse function is the exact opposite of it. So it swaps the inputs and the outputs. So the domain and range would be flipped around exactly. Looking at the simple one f of x, the opposite of tangenting by 2 and adding 5 would be to take off 5 and divide by 2. And that's obvious just looking at it hopefully. Um, but we need a technique to find that so we can do it to the more complicated ones. So um, the standard way of doing it is to replace, replace f of x with a letter, normally y, and then swap those letters around. Then you can rearrange that to make y the subject. And that would be your inverse function. And that's the language used for that is f minus 1 of x. That minus 1 is what you see when you do the inverse of sine, cos and tan. You do inverse sine, sine to the minus 1. Um, so hopefully you've seen that before. Let's take a look at doing the inverse of g now. So again we'll start by swapping over the letters. And we'll times up that denominator to the other side. 
multiply out the brackets. We want to make y the subject, so we need to get both these terms onto one side and everything else onto the other side. Then we can factorise. Fantastic, so that's the inverse of g. Now as I mentioned earlier, when you do inverse functions it swaps the domains and the ranges. So the domain for this function would be the old range. So I know I've rubbed them out but I think the old domain was that x couldn't equal minus 3. So that will now be the range of the inverse. And the old range was that it couldn't be 1, so that's going to be the new domain. So that's the domain and the range for the inverse function. Great, let's now look at an exam style question and do a bit more practice on this. Okay, here we've got an exam style question, um, and it starts with this horrific looking complicated function. Um, and that would be the domain that they're telling us there, x is greater than 3, so you can just keep that to one side. And the first part of the question is to show that it whittles all down to just this. So the first part of the question is just um, playing with algebra. So we get to play around with this and simplify it if we can. Um, and the best idea, we've got two different fractions here, the best thing to do is to get them over the, co the same common denominator. Um, Looking at that, it clearly factorises, so that's a good first step. Let's factorise that. Now by factorising, we can see it's got a common factor of x plus 3. So they've, they've both got a common x plus 3. So to get the common denominator, we just need the x minus 2 over here. So we'll multiply the top and the bottom by x minus 2 on this fraction. Quite a lot of writing, isn't it? But we can now combine these over the same denominator. So just write that once and we can expand the brackets and collect the terms. My writing's getting very wobbly over there. Um, now we've done that, we can factorise the top. And doing that, we can see we've got a common factor that will cancel on the top and the bottom, leaving us just with x plus 1 over x, leaving us with x plus 1 over x minus 2. Which is why you panic, because you realise that's not what the question's asking. That's because I wrote the question wrong. <laughs> Brilliant, we've done it. The next parts of the question, I'm just going to use this now. So I'll replace that with just this. Okay, the next part, we're asked to find the range. Um, again, like before, we're going to do that by drawing a graph. And this is very similar to the example we looked at earlier. So um, if you remember, the best way to draw the graph is to use that trick I showed you of splitting this into two fractions. So see if you can do that. We're going to force the top to look like the bottom, but we don't have x minus 2, we've got x plus 1, so we need to add another 3. And now we know how the 1 over x graph has moved. It will move 1 up and 2 to the right. That's the graph of the function. However, they have actually restricted the, dom the domain, so x is only greater than 3. So x is greater than 3 means we're losing all of this stuff, all of the function before it. We don't care about anything before it, it's just going to start at 3. Um, so the range, the biggest it's ever going to be is at that starting point, and then the smallest it ever reaches will be the asymptote and it's not even going to equal those. So the range is going to be capped on both minimum and maximum. So to find that maximum value would be here. We need to see 
what happens when x is 3, what the y value would be. So that's plugging x is 3 into here. So we'd have 3 plus 1 on the top and 3 minus 2 on the bottom, which is 4. So that's going to be the maximum of g. And it's not going to equal it because um, x would never equal 3. So it's not going to include 4. And then the minimum value is the asymptote here, so 1. And again, it's not going to equal it because an asymptote it will never touch. So that would be the range of g. Brill, there's one more part to this question. Let's take a look at that. OK, final part. Find the exact value of a for which the function equals the inverse function. So clearly we need to start by finding the inverse function of g. See if you can have a go at that. OK, so the inverse function I found there. Now we're setting the function equal to the inverse function and we're replacing x with a. And then we're solving that equation. So the best way to do that is to multiply this denominator up to that side and this denominator up to that side. So we're cross multiplying. I've multiplied out the brackets, now let's get everything onto one side equals to zero and collect the terms. We've got a quadratic to solve there and I don't think that's going to factorise, so we need to use the quadratic formula. So that there is using the quadratic formula. We've got two solutions, plus or minus, but remember that the domain is restricted. It's got to be greater than three. So um, using either logic or using your calculator to see which one's greater than three, you can work out that it's got to be the plus. So we can get rid of the minus answer. It'll just be the plus. And when it says exact value, it does want it exactly as the third. So whether you use a calculator to help you with some of that or not, you need to give your final answer as a third rather than a decimal. And that's it. Well, I hope that was clear. I hope that was helpful. Um, there's a lot to function questions and they tend to use lots of bits of other topics like logs or trig or whatever. So practice lots of different ones. Keep on practicing. I hope that was helpful and enjoy.